Welcome to the Ending Sexploitation Podcast, where we decode sexual harm and provide you with active solutions. I'm your host, Kaylee McNamara. Greetings, my name is Pansy Watson and I'm an attorney at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. This panel is called Male Accountability and Demand and we'll be talking with three advocates in the area of demand reduction about what demand reduction is and how and why it works. Our first guest is Reverend Dr. Marion Hatcher. She is a representative of Space International, a survivor organization representing 10 countries. She herself is a survivor. She's currently on medical leave, but has served for 15 years as a civilian in law enforcement, as a policy analyst and victim advocate, and has coordinated several large-scale anti-trafficking efforts. Next, we have Jamie Crothers. Jamie is Director of Demand Reduction and Policy at Houston-based Street Grace. He's an attorney who led a Texas-wide program to reduce demand and deter sex buyers. We are also joined today by our own Dr. Michael Shively, a researcher with 30 years of experience in research and advocacy related to human trafficking and the effectiveness of demand reduction. Mike, I want to start with you so you can lay the groundwork from a research perspective. Basically, why focus on demand? Well, sound advice when trying to get to the bottom of crimes that are committed for money financially motivated crimes is to follow the money. And if you follow the money in all prostitution and sex trafficking, it originates from the pockets and the accounts of buyers. And it really is that simple. Um, People buy sex for all kinds of different reasons and they're complicated and it isn't just one type of buyer, there's all kinds of different types. But that's at the consumer end of it. The fact that they are willing to buy is what generates the entire market. You know, without the uh, consumer demand and the money that comes from the consumers, there is no revenue stream to animate or give rise to uh, any sex trafficking network or any prostitution operation. Uh, There wouldn't be one brothel in the world. There wouldn't be one person selling themselves online if it weren't for the buyers. So as a logical exercise and me as a research, I try to look at things as, as markets and look at things not just case by case, but as, as tendencies and, uh, you know, all roads lead to one thing that if you could curtail demand, you would shrink and eventually eliminate all prostitution and all sex trafficking. And those two things really can't be separated. Um, in the law, they are dealt with separately. One type is more serious, but the market itself is really one market, and those are just two parts of it. And there's a tremendous amount of overlap between the sex trafficking and the prostitution markets. Uh, but as a logical exercise and just looking at the markets and what drives them and what can be done to stop them, they, they really do need to be seen as markets. And how do you disable, reduce, and eliminate a market? Uh, There's really only one answer. You have to deal with the demand. Um, Another part of the logic of the whole problem is thinking about, well, any market has supply, demand, and distribution, right? Things have to get from the supply side to the consumers or the the distributors. Um, You need a supply. Well, in prostitution and sex trafficking, the supply is humans. It's people mostly women and girls, but particularly when you're talking about minors, there are are substantial numbers of boys too, Um, and and some men, but the tendencies are mostly women and girls. Uh, They happen to be mostly of color uh, in the United States and and throughout Europe. Um, The buyers tend to be uh, whiter and have more money. So there's a class and a race distinction in how these markets work, how these markets work. Uh, But the common denominator of every single market, every single instance of sex trafficking around the entire planet is money. And the money comes from one and only source, and it's buyers. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
Marion or Jamie, do you have any thoughts on this? I think, uh, well, oh, go ahead, Marion. Uh, from my perspective, uh, great introduction to the, the content, uh, Michael. Buyers don't care whether a person is in prostitution, um, <clears throat> quote unquote, uh, because they choose to, so, you know, or if they're being uh, pimped out. Buyers do not care. There is no difference. And that's important to know because um, whether it's prostitution, uh, which is not always trafficking, as Dr. Bradley said, or if it is um, sex trafficking, which is always prostitution, um, it is always uh, based on the vulnerabilities of a human being. And so it's really important to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Jamie? Uh, I would add to that, or, or I could just kind of kind of restate that, um, you know, another reason, an ancillary reason that demand is so important is because buyers are both culpable, as, 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 as Marion just said, uh, and they're catchable. And that makes them a weaker link when we look at human trafficking. Um, they're culpable because they're victimizing someone. They're part of this transaction. And even if that person is in prostitution, there's, that person is the victim of something, or they probably would not be there. And anyway, they are a victim of the power imbalance between themselves and the buyer in that moment, regardless. Uh, so as Michael and Marion both explained, they're culpable. So we're and unlike victims, right? Unlike that victim who doesn't have that culpability. Again, victim of something whether it's circumstances or being pimped. And they're catchable. You know, we're not going to arrest our way out of this problem by arresting pimps, no matter how much we ratchet up the laws, we don't have the resources and the capability. And, and criminals choose this because of its low risk, high reward potential. And a lot of time cases hinge on victim testimony, although we're getting better at that around the country. Um, it's just that extra layer of protection for pimps. Buyers, they just don't have that. They're going to lawyer up, but we can talk about why, because uh, as Michael said, they tend to be more affluent. They tend to have more resources. We can talk about, about dealing with that as well. They're no way, in no way as well protected as pimps. And as Michael and Marion both said, we get rid of them and we essentially uh, end human trafficking or at least greatly reduce it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so it sounds like it's a really effective way to reduce trafficking. Is it an affordable, accessible way for uh, law enforcement to reduce trafficking? Uh, Marion, I know you yourself have been in, in law enforcement in the past. Can you speak to this? Well, in my experience, uh, I'll give the exam example of <clears throat> I have coordinated 18 of 19 um, large scale anti trafficking uh, buyer stings in my role uh, at the, the sheriff's office in Cook County. And the bottom line is when we first began, 60% of the arrests were prostitution, um, street prostitution arrests. Um, maybe five years into, maybe you know, the midpoint, five or six years into it, uh, we have this total switch in the platform, uh, online prostitution, online sex trafficking um, became the, more the norm to the point where 73 or 76 percent of the arrests were um, online and 98 percent of those were back page. The rest were uh, the next highest was Craigslist and then you know the mom and pop ones and two of these. So um, it's really important to look at this first of all as a human issue. So if it's a human issue we have to figure out how to address the problem with or without money. And we, we were very good at partnering across the country with uh, many other law enforcement organizations that got that, that got it. And they felt the same way, the buy-in at the highest level. And so what you have to do is you partner on the, you know, at the, at the, you don't ask people to do anything that they're not already doing. You find out who's doing uh, those types of operations and you ask them, you know, to at the same time of the year, uh, you know, do what they would normally do. But then you bring your uh, arrest statistics, your arrest rescue, rest restore the statistics of 
uh, <clears throat> minors and adults um, and demographics and all the other things, um, you know, buyer uh, demographics and bring all that information together and try to show the actual problem to the general public um, at, on a national scale. And that's basically what we did. What's good about um, my experience is that this was my job. And so I was paid to do that. And I was paid to um, navigate uh, systems, not only in terms of partnering with law enforcement agencies, but also navigating um, collaboration for uh, service provision to make sure, because even if your goal is to go out and arrest buyers, you're going to, to end up having um, women and girls or transgender uh, and boys on the street um, or online get swept up. And so you have to be prepared and we had to make sure that we not only educated law enforcement on the, the tools that they could use to do these types of operations, including artificial intelligence down the road, um, but also, um, which is the box, um, which I think both Jamie and I will speak to, but also to um, be prepared to on the spot do what we normally did, which was um, at that intersect provide uh, at point of uh, arrest or point of inter intervention, um, uh, victim-centered services. And if a woman was, you know, in ready and in need of treatment, have that available. If they needed medical care, have that available. Mental health um, care, they, you know, housing, uh, child care assist, whatever they needed. You had to be ready to do that in order for a person to have an opportunity to exit. By doing it that way, you're not increasing um, the cost of something that you you consider to be important already. And so it's kind of the infrastructure. That's not necessarily the norm in most law enforcement type of scenario. For us, it was. But we were hoping and we were right that there were enough uh, organizations that felt the same way with their enforcement efforts that saw the demand as the fuel for this human rights violation. So, um, the, but let's keep it real. You know, it, it, it costs more to go after buyers. Um, if you look at a regular uh, street level sting operation or online street up, uh, operation, you're typically going to have uh, at, the, at the least seven uh, law enforcement folks, a supervisor, you know, at the sergeant or uh, commander level, lieutenant level, or uh, also you're gonna have a, maybe three undercover female officers, you know, representing uh, three different racial demographics and uh, then three more uh, male uh, officers for the takedown, okay? And you have multiple rooms in a motel room or hotel room or whatever. That is expensive, okay? Um, it's much less expensive to, when when they're going after the women because their their vulnerability has them more visible and let's let, let's just say it's a matter of what's important what's what what changed the game in my opinion was the use of the uh, of artificial intelligence let's say we had a great week or a great day or whatever and we got 300 buyers um in the sting operation that doesn't tell you the true demand, the measure of the demand in your area, in your region. Um, what really does is the ability to use artificial intelligence and we use childsafe.ai most recently, uh, Rob Spector's uh, platform out of New York. You could see 2000 uh, hits of buyers who were in the market to try to buy at that same time and exploit uh, adults and children. And so it's very important to be able to take advantage of that and utilize that because that is a much lower cost, uh, even lower risk uh, way for law enforcement to go after this driving force.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sounds like there are, I mean, there's definitely an investment to be made, but it sounds like there's some new approaches to making that less of an investment and getting more results. Um, it also sounds like, you know, demand reduction has to be really strongly tied to services offered so that it's not just ignoring the needs of the prostituted person. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, can, I address, can I address the cost issue that Marion was just talking about? I would love to hear that. Yes. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right that, you know, over and over in uh, police departments around the country, I've heard them say, well, you know, it really is labor intensive to go after the, the buyers, you know, and it, it's so easy that you can just be in a cruiser on patrol and with long arrest records and uh, poverty and quotas to meet that uh, women are visible. They tend to be very visible and they can see her hop into a car, jump out and establish probable cause, make an arrest without really doing much, right? Uh, my response to that is usually, would you rather, you know, even though it may be on arrest by arrest basis, a whole lot quicker, easier and cheaper to arrest the women and girls, um, ultimately it's pointless unless you're providing services. The only thing, the only good that comes from arresting victims and survivors is if it's only a method to get them into help. And if that help isn't there, if it's not paired that way, if it's really just as punishment, then it's worse than doing nothing. So if you wanna compare something that maybe is a little more expensive, but that actually has a benefit, and a purpose compared to doing something cheaper that is either useless or counterproductive, I would still take, you know, being able to make eight arrests during a year of the right people, the culpable people, the people that create victims and they're the buyers, right? I would rather arrest eight of those than a hundred survivors, especially if the survivors aren't uh, having their charges dropped and having their, um, their convictions vacated and rooted into services, which again, that's the only reason to, to arrest them is to just create a path out. And if that path isn't there, then it's nothing but punitive and it's far worse than doing nothing. So one of, one of my responses to that, well, it's cheaper and easier, is sort of like that old uh, story about, you know, someone that's looking under the street light for their car keys, even though everyone knows they dropped their car keys a block away. And they say, why are you looking over there? And it's, well, the light's better over here, right? You know, it's just, it's the same thing. It's like, even though I know they are not the cause of the problem, I'm going to keep arresting prostituted people because it's easy. And that to me is not how we should, you know, be approaching, you know, law enforcement. Um, uh, so now, the, the other thing about that too is, <clears throat> That, that oh I'm sorry Michael it froze for a minute oh that, so yeah I would uh, just ask the importance of arresting buyers can also be a way of funding the victim services um, <clears throat> there should also there all always be a a panel associated um, it is not always a criminal act in different uh, <clears throat> jurisdictions, it, like here in Cook County, it's a ordinance violation, but there should always be a penalty. Um, and that money can uh, go to victim services um, at a minimum. I personally like the model where a portion of the money funds victim services for adults and minors, but also funds capacity, law enforcement's capacity to go after the demand as well. I, can I, I just have a couple, uh, I want Jamie to be able to get in here, but this is uh, something that I've been looking at a lot, a long time. And, uh, you know, Marion's given a really important angle on it more from experience and just boots on the ground. Um, on a more macro level, the research I've been doing for about 20 years is really to document how things are done throughout the country. And um, s several things are very clear and the evidence is, is extremely strong. We know that over 2,250 uh, police departments at the local levels have engaged in demand reduction activities, right? Um, we know that it breaks out into about 12 or 15 distinct types of tactics. Uh, the vast majority of them are very inexpensive. They're not um, advanced. They're, they're not like heavy into technology. 
Uh, they really are simple and straightforward and any town of any size can, can execute these sort of things. It isn't like you need a highly trained, expensive, specialized unit of vice officers, right? Um, uh, just a week ago, there was an internet-based reverse sting that was targeting men trying to buy sex with children. It was in Irwin, Tennessee, and that's a city of 352 residents. And they arrested seven sex buyers in a matter of hours in a town that size, but they were also able to conduct one of these operations there. So, um, you know, going after the buyers, uh, most of the, if you do it correctly, and this has been done. This is not theory. This isn't like a dream or we need funding from the federal government to do this. This is, this is happening over and over all, all the time throughout the country where the, most of these methods are either free to tax buyers or they're very inexpensive or they actually are revenue positive. The money from the buyers and one thing we know about them, they have disposable income or they wouldn't be buying, right? So they're not destitute. The money from the buyers can underwrite most of the operations themselves or a good chunk of it from law enforcement. They can more than pay for education programs and the back end stuff that's used to try to get buyers to stop being buyers. And they also supplement survivor support services. So I think if you went to any mayor and said, um, we have proven methods and the technology exists and it's tried and true and you can cut your commercial sex market in your city by 50 to 75%. Uh, you could start in about a week or two easily and you can cut your market down. And by the way, it won't hit your budget at all. And in fact, you may make money doing this, right? And there's evidence. This isn't just a sales pitch from a consultant that's trying to push you know, a product. This is, again, this is homegrown stuff from all over the country. You arrest buyers, you release the identity of the buyers so that you deprive them of the thing they value more than anything, which is anonymity. And you get money from them and you use that to support these actions and then you educate them. The majority of buyers are not operating from true compulsion or pathology. They're just more or less regular people that have some really bad ideas for the most part. There obviously are serial killers and psychopaths and misogynists that drive part of the market, but they're, they're a pretty small part. And most buyers are deterrable. Most buyers can be reached, uh, can be changed. And there's evidence about that happening. So, you know, free, effective, proven, sounds really good to me. And there is evidence that these tactics can knock a market down by 50 to 75%. So I think the case is there. That's amazing. Um, Jamie, I'd like to turn to you to talk about, you know, more of this, more of the tactics and strategies that you've experienced in um, the programs that you've helped deploy and some of the ways that, um, some of the strategies that you've utilized to deter sex buyers. Sure, I'd love to talk about that. And we're doing that at Street Grace through artificial intelligence and we're doing other buyer deterrence programs. But to kind of amplify what uh, Michael was just saying or, or to add on to that, one of the main ways that we, we need to incentivize law enforcement to do this. And I think going to cities is a great way to do that. But when we look at the biggest lever we have um, in this issue, it's really policy. Policy can't do everything you know, but it can lay the foundation for everything that you want to happen, or you need to have that policy framework in place. And when we talk about demand and policy, state level policy, we're talking about penalties for buying, for, for buying sex. That is what we're talking about. And Texas, after a seven year odyssey that started in 2014, uh, buying sex is now a state jail felony on the first offense. So this is a huge deal. And we worked on that for, for seven years. And the reason we were so determined to get there, and there were a lot of steps in the way and a lot of things that had to happen um, to get there. In fact, it took three bills, three, three, four sessions and three bills to get there, um, is because we understood quickly, or we're getting an idea, talk to people around the state, what some of the problems were. 
we would go to jurisdictions, and I won't name any names here, but large urban places in Texas, and talk to the PD there. And they're saying, you know, we hear you about the sex bind. We really hear you. And we're tired. We really are tired of arresting the girls. But look, last time I did this, we had all these buyers. We arrested them. And then the DA, you know, let them all off, pleaded them all down or pleaded them all out. So we would talk to prosecutors. And they're like, yeah, you know, we get it. We do get it. But, you know, I've got a line of felonies out the door. These guys come in with a class B misdemeanor and they've lawyered up. Um, you know, I, I have to, I, I don't set my own priorities. I have, you know, and, and that makes sense too, right? So you get the penalties up and all of a sudden prosecutors are incentivized to take these cases because that's how you move up, right? And that's how you become, uh, that's how you move up as a prosecutor, not by prosecuting class B misdemeanors, but by prosecuting and winning felonies. And it also, the law enforcement gets more excited, okay? We're going to be prosecuting felons. It puts, pe it puts the problem in the correct perspective. Um, lowering penalties for sex sellers, cranking them up for buyers. It opens up a lot of other avenues like asset forfeiture and things like that that you can't constitutionally do with a misdemeanor. People are like, well, take his vehicle if he drove, if he, if he used it to pick her up on the street. Well, that's a $30,000 Dodge Durango that you're now impounding or keeping because for a $1,500 class B misdemeanor, that, that won't work. Um, it opens that up. It opens up a, you know, a huge panoply of other things by getting into that felony level. But most of all, it sends a direct message to frontline folks, prosecutors, hey, we care about this issue and we want you to prosecute these cases. Law enforcement, stop arresting victims. This will come with different penalties are. This is who we want you to arrest. And you know, I'm based in Houston. Street Grace is actually based in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And so we work in the Texas legislature, the Georgia legislature, and we have an office and a team in Tennessee. So one of my big projects is going to be exporting this, you know, how do we do it in Texas? trying to replicate that in Georgia and in Tennessee. And it's a very, it's a long game, you know, and it's not the ultimate solution, but it does provide that, like I said, that foundation that everything else could, can be built on. And um, in my opinion, it's fairly necessary, although it takes a while to get there. Okay, can I just uh, add something to that? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I, I think, well, I want to first agree with you that it, is extremely helpful to, to have prostitution be a felony level where it belongs, right? This is not a this is not a low level vice crime misdemeanor. It's that way on the books, and it shouldn't be because every felony you can think of, including homicide and armed robbery and kidnapping and rape, every high level felony you can think of is just attracted to and generated by prostitution. So it really doesn't belong as a misdemeanor. But, but I, I wouldn't want someone to come away with hearing you talk about the legislative success in Texas by thinking we need to wait for that, right? Okay. It, right, so I mean, I know you weren't saying this, but I just wanna make sure I make something really clear. Demand reduction can happen absolutely everywhere. It can even happen where prostitution has been fully decriminalized. It closes off many avenues and it makes it a lot harder, but that doesn't mean that there are not things that can be done, right? And in a lot of cities, it's, it's worse than saying that it's a misdemeanor. In many cities, they really treat prostitution as an ordinance violation. They don't even charge them with violating the, straight, the state crime of prostitution as a misdemeanor and go through district courts they ticket them and have the, give them an order to appear in a city attorney's office and it's a civil matter, right? But there are some advantages to cities for doing that. For example, if you're gonna find buyers and you're a city and you're using your city budget to do 100% of the policing that generates all those arrests, but then they go to district court and get fined, all of that revenue goes into a state fund, right? And they don't necessarily have control of what happens beyond that. In some cities, they've figured out that if they're going to do all the work of arresting the guys, they can put them in the city attorney's office, they can hit them with a fine, and they get all that money to help underwrite future police operations and also to create programs like John schools to educate the buyers and also um, to support survivor programs, right? So while well, ultimately you're right, I think we're better off with it being a felony that there are still workarounds and there are still, you know, it isn't, it isn't like all benefit and no downside. I, I have had police tell me 
I'm so glad this isn't a felony because there's so much more paperwork. When it's a low-level misdemeanor, you basically write a ticket in order to appear. You call it an arrest, but you send them on their way, and then they show up, and no one contests it, right? And the other thing about a felony is people are more likely litig to litigate, right, to lawyer up and to fight it and, and all that. So again, I'm agreeing, but I, I really do want to make it clear that um, there's so many different tactics, and the nice thing about looking at the whole country over 40 years of them trying different things is that there's an adaptation for every setting. So you can, maybe it's not even pursued as a criminal matter, but a civil matter. There are, there are success stories there. You know, Denver uh, sent all of their arrestees for decades into the city attorney's office, and they had John School programs. Other places, um, you know, they they handle it differently. But, um, you know, but by reverse stings, internet-based reverse stings, uh, using these contractor-based, um, you know, technology methods that, that turn loose bots on the online communications to deter, those are extremely cost-effective and they're really promising and can also be coupled with people responses through law enforcement to do stings and everything. So. There are just so many methods that have been tried in every conceivable environment, um, legal framework, uh, whether the prosecutors are, are actually on board or not. You know, I mean, I, I've got um, stories like Waco, Texas, where uh, a patrol officer who is a woman that was the decoy in these operations wanted to start a John school. She went to the DA's office and said, hey, if we had this, would you order the guys to go to it? And the DA said, nope, not interested. So instead of just saying, yeah, I guess we can't do a John school here, she went to the city attorney's office and they said, sure, that sounds good. Then she went to the chief of police. Hey, instead of charging them with the state crime, what if we just cite them and send them to the city attorneys? Then we could put them in this program and charge them a fee and use the fee to support our programs here. And she got buy-in and that, op, that program has been in place since at least 2008 in Waco. So, um, you know, there's just so many varieties. I just wanna make it really clear that, you know, that there's uh, improving legislation is great and we should keep working on it and felonies better than misdemeanor. But in the meantime, there are plenty of workarounds. Mike, I don't, I don't, I don't, I not only just agree with you, I actually do you one better. I don't think that you can actually get the enhanced penalties and the legislative attention without having that anti-demand work. We had people come from Waco, from Houston, from Lubbock, where anti-demand tactics been put in place. They'd seen the success, they'd gotten the attention, and the legislature looks at that and they're like, oh, well, our officers want this, our prosecutors want this. Well, maybe, maybe we should start taking this seriously because these are the people we are counting on to end human trafficking. So I think, you know, 100%. Without the... Um, Showing the, showing the people who are doing the work that this will work and having them try it, you're never going to get enough support um, for an anti-demand concept at the state level. I would like to also say that, you know, have knowing, I'm glad that I know you uh, more uh, formally now, Jamie, uh, knowing, uh, you know, uh, Detective Joe Scaramucci and uh, survivor leaders, you know, Becky Charleston, uh, who was like one of my daughters, people involved down there, <clears throat> and it was such a heavy lift and it did take a long time, but it was so utterly important. Not unlike what we did, you know, we started off uh, with eight jurisdictions and it grew to over 160 or 70 and, and more than half the country involved. So the most important thing that, you know, I saw with what you accomplished in Texas was you didn't give up and you grew, grew the support and the buy-in and all of the other tactics, it built on all of the other tactics and systemic collaboration, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> which Michael and I, since 2010, I believe, um, have you know worked closely together on in different ways. And so I do want to just say, you know, congratulations, because you know, obviously, I'm tickled pink that it's a felony in Texas, yeah. and <clears throat> uh, hope that you know it can be replicated because I've seen replication of not only tactics but replication of fines and penalties, uh, whether it be at the ordinance level or the the state level, as long as the revenue gets back not to a general fund. But right. it gets back 
to uh, John School uh, survivor programming and increasing the capacity for law enforcement to address demand, um, I think it's, it's wonderful. The problem that I have is when the money ends up going into a general fund that does nobody any good other than, you know, the streets and sanitation. That's amazing. So it really sounds like, um, first of all, that demand reduction tactics aren't one size fits all, that different jurisdictions can really craft uh, different approaches that all seem to have um, a lot of effective results. They can do that affordably. And as long as they direct the funding specifically, they can really basically have the people who cause the harm pay for the harm. Mm -hmm. And really, sort of justice. And exactly, it is the, the you know the federal uh, view of restorative justice. You do the harm, you pay for the harm, and you pay, and you have to make the victim whole. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's fantastic. So it really sounds like demand reduction is the way. Absolutely. Are there any final thoughts or um, feelings that you want to share about the work that you're doing or where you'd like to see demand reduction go in the near future? Um, maybe even how you feel about demand reduction in light of um, full decriminalization efforts. That was immediately what my mind went to when you said, what are you, what are you thinking about demand? <laughs> we're, we're actually, Street Grace, we're actually gonna be doing a uh, a webinar on this, but um, you can edit that shameless plug out if it's not. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's making sure that as when we, we talk, when we talk about full decrim and combating this movement, you know, understanding that there is a middle ground there that I think most people, most people on this side are, you know, um, we need to be more victim centric, we need to be more restorative, um, it needs to be services and not punishment. Um, and understanding that, but having, um, but keeping that position that, you know, the buyers are still culpable. And so I think there's some common ground there. Of course, there are a lot of very vocal, very full decrim. No, it's an entirely, <laughs> it's a transaction between two adults sort of things and sex work is real work and all this other stuff, um, which I'm um, deeply opposed to. So I think that is one of the next big frontiers in anti-demand is making sure that you know, we can try to meet and make compromise where we can because we do have that big point in common and that is the treatment of prostituted individuals, whether trafficked or not. Um, and plan for, you know, uh, establishing bulwarks around sex buying remains criminal, getting that truth out, confronting this message when it, it is obviously completely incorrect when we talk about uh, the power balance in the equation that sex work is real work that it's you know that it could be regulated you know it, you know it, and, and be made safe you know that's never going to happen and so we can make it fairer we can make it more just and we can make it far more equitable through anti-demand tactics but we need to as I think as a movement as as, as a group of committed advocates be ready to confront and defend um, against this force since uh, the presidential um race, the 2020 uh, presidential race began, um, I co-authored a letter to the presidential, 2020 presidential candidate with Rebecca Bender, <clears throat> Rebecca Bender Initiatives, um, pushing back on, because they were trying to have full decrim in New York, and, they, and at, at that time, we were kind of addressing it there, when it was like seven other jurisdictions that were thinking about it and about to introduce, you know, legislation at some point. So I uh, co-authored that letter. Uh, then I uh, wrote a letter when they were trying to do it in DC to the DC council, uh, pushing back on full decrim there. Fortunately, you know, the first effort in New York died, but the, the, the effort in DC, you know, many, many players involved died. Um, but one of the things that I want to, uh, and then in Vermont, I think I wrote the Senate um, there when they were thinking about it. And many other things have come from there. Uh, we don't have time to unpack that. But one of the things that I want to um, bring up here that you mentioned, Jamie, is the fact that 
you can't fully decriminalize the violence out of sex buying. You can't legalize. It doesn't matter what model you have. This is violence against women primarily. This is violence against women. And once that transaction takes place, they feel they can do anything. And statistics, you know, there's plenty of research out there uh, that, that we've seen and, and Michael has seen. They feel like once that money has changed hands, whether it be with the person, the exploited person, or with the pimp or trafficker, that they can do whatever they want. You can't make this safe. It is a violent and exploitive industry and we should not be looking to make it legal. We should not be looking to, to fully decriminalize, which really pulls back everything. Now they can't even enforce anything. Uh, law enforcement, it takes that ability um, out, you know, and then you can have brothels next door, you know, uh, all types of crazy stuff that people, once they're informed about, start saying, oh, okay. But when they only hear the one side, when they think fully decriminalized, most people are being tricked into thinking the the seller, the, the the victim. Well, who doesn't want, we know, we don't want the victims held accountable for their own exploitation because if they don't have a pimp for trafficker, society, in my opinion, and I think uh, Jamie spoke to it earlier, society, in my you know opinion, is the, is the pimp because they're not making sure that people can meet their basic needs without uh, losing their dignity and respect and having to sell their body, or Michael might have said it. Um, and so we can't take the violence out of this. It is an inhuman and it, it is a degrading um, experience. I've been there and done that. And, you know, from my experience, the violence that I experienced was 99% at the hand of the buyer, not the trafficker. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Michael, any thoughts on pushing back on the full decrim movement? Well, it's necessary. Uh, I think the biggest threat to undermining commercial sex markets, and you know, again, that's one part of it is prostitution, and the other part is sex trafficking, um, is uh, the successful uh, campaign that's being waged to change how commercial sex is viewed. Um, so, you know, I, I think until fairly recently, we could just, you know, in a way, not take it as seriously. It's just yapping on the sidelines by some committed activists, and they really hadn't gained much um, tangible traction, right? You know, it's like, okay, they're going to make this argument that sex work is work. Well, okay, you know, but meanwhile, let's keep working under the assumption that we need to prohibit this, right? Um, What's really uh, alarming right now is in the last five years, um, really for the first time, major party candidates have openly declared support for full decriminalization of prostitution. It wasn't just the Green Party or Libertarians, people with no chance who ran on a platform and got 1% and went away for another cycle, right? These are people that are winning. Um, I've been keeping track of it over the past year, and I've, I've got a list of over 65 um, office holders in elected positions that are supporting it. Uh, we've had seven states that have had not just talk about it, but they've actually introduced bills for full decriminalization. Um, other states have kind of thought, thought they were going to lose that, so they have study bills, which are just kind of a foot in the door so that they can work towards full decrim. Um, and we also have at the local level, they're actually, I mean, decriminalization isn't a threat over the horizon. It's actually here already. And it's at the local level. So Washington County in uh, Michigan, it's Ann Arbor area. Uh, more than a year ago, the prosecutor said, we are not going to prosecute prostitution offenses. Um, over a year ago, it's a year and a half now in Baltimore, the prosecutor there said the same thing. And that was meant to be a temporary COVID response. And after a year, um, it was declared permanent. So prostitution has been fully decriminalized in two counties in the United States uh, for over a year. It's here. And uh, I really hope that 10, 15 years from now, we aren't seeing state after state start to tip and pass legislation and wish that way back in 2021, we would have really dug in and done something different. You know, I, I believe that 
if the first one or two or three states were to actually pass full decrim bills, um, given that public support has steadily grown over the decades um, for full decriminalization, I think you know there could be real trouble. And if full decrim happens, every bit of law enforcement action is gone, right? All of those options are gone. What you're left with is public education. And think of the challenge saying, well, let's try to convince everyone this is a really bad idea, where after a 50 year campaign, the, they finally passed a law saying, you know what, this really isn't very harmful, we're better off legalizing it. You know, so think of the, the hill you're climbing there, right? So I think if we really need a sense of urgency, we need to nip it in the bud, we need to make sure that the first state does not actually change the law in that direction. Um, and I don't think it's over if one state passes it, but boy, we really need to see this as the biggest threat. Because in my logic that I work with is that you cannot really shrink the problem or make it go away without dealing with its root cause, which is demand. And 90 something percent of what you can do to combat demand is going to be gone if we fully decriminalize it best to get on top of it, in front of it, make sure it really doesn't start going that direction, right? So that's that's my appeal. Mm -hmm. well, Absolutely. I'd, I'd like to just um, piggyback off of what Michael said and end with this for me. We've had over 50 years a failed science experiment in the brothels, the counties in um, Nevada where this was indeed legal. And what you had was increased uh, organized crime, increased uh, violence against women and children, increased uh, trafficking because the demand would be so high when you do this that you have to bring in more supply from other uh, states. Um, we've seen this when they fully decriminalized in, um, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, was it Australia, Michael? Um, and we've seen it with the legalization that they're now trying to get rid of in Germany. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's not good because you know. And this is the thing: a lot of people don't think about the co-occurring crimes that are associated. I've seen tens of thousands of additional charges. Buying sex is not a victimless crime; it harms the victim, but it also brings with it narcotics charges. It also brings with it weapons charges. It also brings with it um, child endangerment. It also brings with it um, uh, law enforcement being um, uh, law, you know, law enforcement officers being uh, harmed, um, kidnapping, murder, attempted murder. There are many, many, many charges that are associated with this. Many people that we work with are, you know, looking at what's called, you know, the you know, kind of American version of partial decrim is called the equality model. Now, in its ideal, it is to not hold the victim accountable for their own exploitation, provide exit services and strategies when they're ready, um, hold buyers, pimps, traffickers, and brothel keepers. Uh, owners uh, accountable. You can't let the bad guys off the hook here. You can't let bad actors off the hook here. You just can't. And um, in its ideal, I am in total agreement, but we have to work with the realities that we have. And so while it, I never want a woman to be arrested in order for her to get help, I don't think any of us want that to be the segue for uh, a person to get uh, services to make the, to, to, for rehabilitation. But that was my story. I got help because law enforcement had, was the uh, introduction to getting me out of uh, the exploited uh, situation that I was in. I got jail-based treatment. Um, end up working there, you know, which of course is not necessarily uh, was an expectation, but um, it worked for me. Now, having been there and worked side by side with law enforcement, none of us, I mean, you know, we actually stopped arresting 
Powell at the direction of the sheriff stopped arresting the women uh, years ago and focused on the buyers and provide services to the women. Um, that's, a, that's a great ideal, but let's keep it real. And, you know, a lot of people that, that I know that, you know, I love, you know, I, I think I've been drummed out of the feminist core or the pure abolitionist core because until we truly have the right system in place, sometimes that's the only way people are going to get help because I was always high. I was always under the influence and I could not make good decisions uh, on my behalf, let alone, you know, the child I lost, the youngest child, which I lost custody of while I was missing for two years. So we have to look at the reality. The equality model is the ideal. That is where we want to go in terms of, but we have to have the buy-in of law enforcement. You have to have that. And you have, we don't have a social service structure that captures everything that we need to be able to capture to make sure that the services are in place across the board and can house and can make sure that we're not setting people up for further failure. Um, and, 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 you know, when it comes down to it, we have to meet the need with what we've got. If we have to put a Band-Aid on it to make it better until we have a real answer, that's fine. Sometimes, you know, I think a lot of the problem uh, is that we can't get the, the sex trafficking community and the domestic violence community to work closer together because the domestic violence community has a lot of the service provision foundation that the sex trafficking service provision community can really use, but everybody's fighting for money. So that doesn't necessarily happen. We need more collaboration. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's really insightful. There's I, ideals and then there's reality and we have to work with our reality for sure. Well, I really want to thank you all for being here today. I think that demand reduction is a really, really powerful approach, not only to reducing the prostitution and trafficking market, which are deeply intertwined, um, essentially the same thing, um, but also, you know, to really discuss how, I, I mean, it sounds to me from your parting uh, remarks that um, demand reduction is really the way to push back on full decriminalization, is really understanding that it is justice to make those who, who cause harm to pay for that harm and, and to recognize that prostitution is harm. It really is violence against women. Um, I thank you all for being here today. This was incredibly informative and I encourage anybody who's listening to this to reach out to you and to us and to learn more about demand reduction and um, using demand reduction as an approach to push back on full decrim. Thanks. <laughs>